Einen wunderschönen guten Morgen. I would say if we were speaking in German, if and if it would be morning, but it isn't. And still, it's worth listening for all of you because today you will be taking part basically in a discussion of very interesting people who will introduce themselves in a second. And we will be discussing basically the future of teaching and learning languages. Stay tuned. It's going to be very cool. My name is Maria and I'm a YouTuber or an edutuber as we say about ourselves because we don't do kittens and gaming. We do education on YouTube. I teach German for advanced learners. And yeah, today I have the honor of being the host of this wonderful meeting. And yeah, I have four great YouTubers for you who will speak for themselves. Now it's a difficult decision. Let's go with Lucrezia first. Please <laughs> tell us something about yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. And thank you for being here. And thank you, Expo Lingua, for having me today. I'm very happy to be here with you all. And I hope you're all doing well and are safe, whatever you are. Um, I'm Lucrezia, I'm from Rome, Italy, and I teach Italian to foreign students, both in person and online. And I'm also a content creator on YouTube. So as Maria said, I'm also an ed YouTuber. <laughs> um, and I create content for Italian learners uh, for pretty much all levels, but I mainly create content for um, yeah, intermediate to advanced students. Um, yes, that's it, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Lucrezia. It's wonderful that you could join us. Michael, please go next. Yeah, is it my turn already? So what Lucrezia said, hi all. And uh, just a quick uh, rundown. I run a little so a German learning company. Uh, I exclusively work online these days or already for a couple of years now, and uh, which I think is the future of language learning anyhow, but we might hear more about that later. And I've been teaching German for over 20 years in all possible settings with all possible people. Uh, I slipped into it. I was young and needed the money and it turned out I'm actually good at it and uh, I enjoy it. So I stuck with it. Uh, I've been doing it for over 20 years, I might have mentioned that, and uh, what, what I mostly enjoy is the contact with the people and the discovery that language learning actually represents. If you learn a language, you, you discover a whole new world, you, you can create new relations, and uh, there is actually so much joy. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of pain, um, but that usually comes from maybe uh, being in the wrong environment, yeah, but we will possibly also discuss that later. So. Uh, happy to be here and uh, very curious how this will turn out and uh, nice to have all of you here and thanks Maria for, for organizing, for hosting this and organizing, uh, thanks for organizing Expo Lingua Team. Yeah. Thank you Michael, those were a lot of spoilers already but you will hear more interesting stuff later. I just noticed we are four names with M and one with L which is, which doesn't mean anything but it's funny. So um, let's go with Maha next. Maha, I have to say, Maha is the person with without whom my never uh, my my YouTube channel had never existed. So basically, she was my inspiration back then, four years ago, when I was watching her videos, and I was like, "Oh my God, she's so awesome! I have to do it too." So now here I am with uh, soon two hundred and fifty thousand subscribers, thanks to Maha. Uh, no, thanks to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, reminding me and, and talking about this all the time. It's a pleasure and an honor for being uh, one uh, idea or one person who uh, made you uh, become who you wanted to be and create the channel that you wanted. Uh, hi, everybody, and thank you, Expo Lingua, for hosting me again. Thank you, Maria, for hosting this. My name is Maha. I'm a Palestinian. Uh, living in Italy and I'm uh, an Arabic teacher. I've been on YouTube for the past or since 2008, since I'm not good with numbers. Is it eight or 18? 
eight. <laughs> eight. <laughs> eight, yeah. Um, and uh, now I've been uh, pulling all my concentration into my small business. My uh, I've, I've created a, a small gr- group, as M- Michelle or Michael uh, mentioned, uh, but only this year that I created it. And now I'm uh, concentrating on uh, teaching uh, Arabic online, of course, like many of you. And I have been holding these courses since uh, uh, February, neglecting a little bit my YouTube channel, but still... <laughs> Still holding and, and keeping up. So yeah, that's me. Thank you so much, Maha. And last but not least, we have Martin. Hello, everyone. My name is Martin, uh, also known as the, the Swedish Lad, uh, a name given to me by John Green, the author of The Fault in Our Stars. Back in the day, I know, I know, starting on a high. Uh, I'm from Sweden. Uh, I live in Stockholm, but I am from the south of Sweden. Uh, so I speak a slightly different dialect that is closer to, I guess, German and French, and especially Danish. Uh, my channel is it's not... 100% language based. It's language and culture and also how it bridges to other languages uh, because I, I do these videos where I challenge other people to speak my language and then I try to speak theirs and that's how we we all come together in this beautiful universe called YouTube. Uh, so it's, it's a way to bridge Swedish uh, with other languages, I guess. Fun to be here. Thank you, Martin. So without further ado, I will be announcing the topic of our discussion today. Um, Let's play a little. Let's imagine that all the education programs and all the methodology concerning language learning and language teaching disappeared overnight. We don't know how, we don't know where, but it's gone. No one knows how to teach or learn languages and we have plenty of languages, we have plenty of people who want to learn languages, and there we are. We are the last experts on earth who can decide how it should be done. So let's see what we can bring together in terms of most effective, most efficient ways of dealing with languages. Feel the responsibility, dear colleagues. Whoever wants to go first, what is, in your opinion, the most crucial thing about learning or teaching languages? It has to be fun. I mean, if you make it fun, then you don't see it as something that is like uh, something you have to do. And my experience is that you learn faster if it's fun. Uh, It becomes a natural part of what you want to be and do. I would have said the same joy. I would have said that you enjoy it, but I would not have said that you make it fun because it is fun by nature. There's nothing you have to do. You have to actually do something to make it not fun. So um, that's my experience. But I, agree. Also spontaneous. I agree with both of you, but I would say my language is not fun at all. And I have to make it fun. <laughs> I have to make it fun. So yeah. I, no, come on. So we have we have a question in the chat, the first person asking how to make fun, which is a legitimate question. So could you be more specific? What does it mean? Fun, learning a language? Michael, what do you say? <laughs> well, the fun is you, you see a word and you suddenly understand. You, you have the chance to, for the first time in your life, to understand something new. So, and, and that is what you've done as a child, just not consciously. Now you can have the same experience like a child, but consciously. And that's an experience I, I would lick my fingers for. And uh, so that happens when you really get something. And there is so many possibilities to get something when you discover a new word or a new phrase, or you see, oh, the Germans do it like that. It's a pain because you have to learn how to do it constantly like we do. But uh, with a bit of practice, it's it's... It's yeah, fun is there. There is nothing you have to do, really not. It's uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, that's that's why I'm doing it for twenty years. Yeah, and I, yeah. So do something for twenty years and and go deeper and deeper and deeper and and, and you will understand. <laughs> I agree to a certain extent. It has to be fun, of course, but I think we have to go through ups and downs to really appreciate the fun moments. So, for example, we have to go through difficult moments where we just would stop everything to appreciate the moment, the moments when we really have fun and 
enjoy the process, in my opinion. I don't know if you agree or not. <laughs> Let me know. Well, where there's fun, there's pain, right? So um, yeah. otherwise there's nothing. So I, I agree. But you I don't have to do that... much to make it painful just so that you can enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, yeah, of course, that's true. But I mean, painful times just come naturally. We don't have to do anything to make them painful. <laughs> yeah. And it also depends on the students, I think. Um, there are some students that make everything fun and some students that are not really um, in the mood for something fun. They just want to go deeper in the language um, without the fun component, if that makes sense. So it really depends on the students I have in front of me sometimes. What do we do if uh, people come up and say, you know, I don't have a talent for languages. So uh, I'm a rather technical, mathematically thinking person. Uh, it's just something that I can do better than languages. Um, what do we say? What is it with talent about learning languages? Well, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I believe that most people can acquire uh, knowledge, but they have different paths of getting there. Some people need to really get nitty gritty with grammar and really get that system down. Others might need the, the inspiring, fun loving uh, person in front of the screens telling them things. So uh, it really depends on like you as a person, how do I obtain knowledge in the best possible way? And is there a way to do that with languages? That was more a question than an answer, but. Uh, talent is an interesting question. Uh, I think scientists still argue about it. And the question is, what does it matter? Uh, because if there is something like talent, you don't really have a choice. You either have it or you don't. And um, I think talent is responsible for the last 20, if not 10% of the whole process. So until then, you everybody kind of can get to a certain degree of language um, mastery. Yeah. Um, if, if you say I don't have a talent, I, I would assume in most cases that that is based on your past experience and it might be that you have been exposed to a learning system that doesn't really s suit you. Yeah? In, in school, it's a different kind of teaching and uh, goal setting than it is now in, in, as an adult. So I would rather doubt that you don't have a talent and look into where you come from and what your experience was and then see how can we optimize that. That would be my approach. In, in most cases, that would actually do the job. So what is our strategy? If we deal with students who think that, for example, talent is important or they have no idea what to start with, it's up to us to say, okay, relax and enjoy the ride, which is step one, step two, step three. We, we have to decide what are the steps. So go to the country where the language is spoken, or what? So they don't know anything about learning languages. They just know there are different languages and they want to learn them. The rest is up to us. In my situation, it's um, first making it, making it fun, showing that it's possible to speak Arabic in my particular situation, um, by giving them the easiest part of the language in the first lessons or the funniest the most logical answers to any of their questions. Then they get, you know, you, you implant this passion in them of wanting, of knowing that they can do it, of wanting to go deeper and deeper and to discover more complex things, knowing that they already know something that is complex, logical at the beginning. Usually that's how I start my courses. I don't start with ABC. I give them like a sentence, difficult, that I usually teach in, a, in an advanced course. And, and show them logically how they will be one day able to understand and figure out everything. And then you really implant this passion, implant this love of wanting to know more and to continue um, getting to learn the language. <laughs> or a sentence that they have been hearing for so long, but they didn't know the real meaning of it. Like, assalamu alaikum. I show them how logical it is. Yeah. And what it means. So, um, so they get more involved in, into 
learning the language. It's getting dark here. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm in Sweden. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what do you think, for example, about passive vocabulary and active vocabulary? So, the problem I hear very often from our students or my customers, they say, you know, I feel like a dog. I understand everything, but I can't say anything. And I have people like this, for example, in our C1 course, which is a little shocking because if you're if you were able to learn vocabulary up to C1, then how come you you never try to speak? And they say, no, I will speak as soon as I'm able to speak without mistakes. So how do you deal with that? Yeah. I think that's impossible to wait for the moment to not make mistakes anymore because I've been, for example, I've been learning English for more than 10 years, 15 years, and I still make mistakes today. But if I didn't start speaking the language, I would never like be at the level I'm at today. So I don't think there's the right, a right moment to start speaking you just start speaking whatever you feel. I mean, wherever you feel ready, yes, to a certain extent, but you have to try. You have to put yourself in the position like to speak, actually. Even if you make mistakes, that's okay. I make mistakes in Italian as well, and that's my native language. I mean, mistakes are part of the process, are part of the game. You cannot really avoid them. And just waiting will make it worse in my opinion you just yeah you just wait for the right moment but you will never um decide when it's the right moment to start speaking it's not that easy unfortunately yeah because it's a psychological issue um you look stupid when you make mistakes and you go abroad maybe you want something from someone and they give you the feeling oh i'm in a hurry come on yeah, get to the point and then they switch to English. Everybody complains about Berliners changing, switching to English when they start hearing the slightest nuance um, that you might be not a native German speaker. And um, so it's a problem that you as a language teacher can only partially address, I would say, or we as language teachers. Yeah, it is something you as a learner really have to dig into and see why am I actually so worried? Why do I want to always be 100% certain? And uh, maybe you can loosen up a bit, but it might take some time. So be patient with yourself. It doesn't mean you have to wait until you are ready to say everything fluently. Uh, that also kind of never really works. Yeah? Prepare. Prepare as good as you can and then give it a shot. But again, don't blame yourself if you don't find the courage to do so. Rather look into the reasons why you are afraid to speak. And that's a completely different field yeah? called psychology. So I don't touch it in that sense. I can only guide people in that direction. So can we say that when we we are preparing the future of, of you know teaching and learning languages, should we say that the psychological aspect is at least as important as the content part of the whole thing? Because I feel in my practice that it's not enough to deal with grammar, vocabulary, and all that language stuff. You have to start with the people. You have to hear them when they say, especially if you work not with children but with adults who say for example uh, I lost my identity I, I can't speak as, a, as an adult because in my home country I used to be university professor I was respected I was an expert in my field and now I came to for example Germany and here I feel like an idiot because they talk to me like like I was a child so then maybe we should integrate the psychological aspect from the very beginning. What do you think? Totally agree, Maria. Yeah. Yeah. We discussed good, it. Good, an good answer, Maria. You shouldn't <laughs> agree with everything I say, I told you before. No, and I mean, I've, I've, been, uh, I've been to Poland. I mean, that kind of says it all. I feel language-wise very lost. <laughs> Whenever you try, try to say something, it's like, uh, hello <laughs> in both directions so uh, there's definitely a, a psychological aspect to it and I, I, but I, I do think to, to strike on, on the last point we were on I think the biggest mistake is the fear of making mistakes because you know the, the whole idea of 
you you pick up this much if you read something, this much if you hear it, this much if you see it. But for us language teachers and for those learning languages, actually speaking to yourself just puts another layer uh, on top of that. So uh, of course we have to. I mean, there's a there's a thing called I I, I was fall back back on this Danish English. You know, they speak English in a certain way in Denmark, and I love it because they are from Denmark. The same as if I'm from Sweden learning Italian or German or Arabic, I will speak with a certain accent because I am from here. And that's just that's just the way it should be. Trying to emulate something perfectly, especially when you're learning, I think that's putting the bar a little bit higher. Yeah, I agree. And you also have to try to put, put a little bit of yourself into what you're doing. So if, he, if it shows that you're not perfectly or that you're not speaking perfectly Italian for example it's it doesn't matter to me like as a teacher I do not encourage um, imitation like to the like to 100% imitating native speakers I don't like that because the outcome could be not so great then you will make more mistakes, definitely, because at least speaking about German, every time someone from my customer says, oh no, my husband is German, but what I learned from him wasn't good at all because he makes so many mistakes. I said, I told you, uh, native speakers don't have any idea about um, yeah, their language, how to speak it correctly. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> um, I, I had an idea that, well, in fact, how... Um, a language lesson should look like if we speak about the school context. Normally, we have one teacher who speaks uh, the language on a proper level, and we have a bunch of students who listen to each other's mistakes, which in my point of view is not the optimal solution. So I could imagine that if we mix native speakers and language learners, and we let them do some projects, for example, so if we work with, I don't know, teenagers at school, um, we don't teach them the language. It's, I guess it's more the Scandinavian way of dealing uh, with languages. So we give them a project which is about something else, about, I don't know, about gaming. And they have to use their language. And they have two languages in this group. So one of them are natives of, for example, English, and the others speak the other language. So, and, and they have to work together. What do you think about this learning by doing? That's a beautiful approach. Um, I, I learned English that way. Yeah? And, and if you fall in love with I fell in love with an American lady and uh, that motivated me. So that was learning by doing because I wanted her attention and affection and I wanted to communicate with her. But I also then did everything I could in English and computer games were in English. And my son learned possibly also some English via computer gaming and interacting with people. So the, the aim is to do the same things you do in your native language in, an, in a different language, right? Or other things uh, because you want to expand your horizon. Uh, it's a wonderful approach. The question is, can you actually simulate that? And does it make sense to simulate that? Or do you prepare someone for the real thing? That, that would be a question I would put into the room. What do you mean by simulate? Well, if you have a classroom and you want to have a project, like I, there's different ways to organize a classroom, right? You can have like little groups and then they give them a project like you just said. Okay, guys, you do, you organize a, a Stadt rally, yeah, a city rally, or you organize it, like in the B1 exam, there's an example, you organize a trip for elderly people through Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. For, God ever, for whatever reason, you have to do this because no one ever will do this in their lives. So how real is that? How, how much can you engage? It's a little bit like pretending to be somewhere instead of doing the real thing. So how far can you get by pretending? And I think a classroom, in a way, is always pretending. Yeah, so, or even an online course, yeah, let me not forget that. But so, I don't know. So that's always the key. As a teacher, you, you're always dealing with pretension. You're not dealing with the real thing. That would be my, my claim for now. That, yeah. But maybe it creates a safe place for practicing. So especially if we speak about adults who are afraid of speaking, 
Uh, I even heard about courses where every person had a persona for the course. So you could basically invent a character, invent a name, invent a profession, invent everything. So which is which would be perfect uh, in the online context because like um, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog if you remember this old cartoon. So you could be anyone and if you're afraid of speaking as yourself, the professor or whatever, so you can invent a new persona and you can say you're a striptease dancer and, and you don't care about your academic uh, past. So what, what do you think about that? If we bring more fiction into the classroom? Yeah. Can, can I quickly say I always hated this kind of role play <laughs> because that wasn't me. And the question is, who am I? But that's another question. So, do you want to talk but, about I, it? but I'm fine. Like, yeah, let's do that later, Maria. But uh, but that's just my my view of things because I had to do this so many times. I uh, I said in over twenty language courses, but um, it's fine if people like it. Like, let them like it. Yeah. So it's a way to practice it, of course. But I really, really hated it. I uh, I tried it. I had heard it from one of my, uh, the professors in a university that I used to teach in where he used to give uh, each of his foreigner students an Arab name, <laughs> an Arabic name. <laughs> so I tried it for one month. That was uh, about seven or eight years ago. And I've never, I, I never used it again. <laughs> it's so difficult. They, of course, you call their, their name, their Arabic name, they don't remember. And it's, 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 it's good, you know, the theory of it, but putting it into practice, it's not something that's easy. It's better to keep what they are, but they are learning a new language. <laughs> With all the difficulty in the day, it is, it, it has. Yeah, it's not a big deal if you make mistakes and if you're a doctor and you're a prof it's, I already, first lesson that I do with any course of mine, I tell them, I appreciate your determination and I so admire you for picking to start learning such a difficult language. So already for me, you are top, yeah, whatever you do, for me, you are already idols for choosing, for picking this challenge, putting yourself into this difficulty <laughs> of learning such a difficult language. But then, you know, so slowly, slowly they get to learn the language. So there's no uh, need to create fictional characters, I think, or names or, or, uh, or so uh, to simplify the fact uh, of you ending up ha making mistakes, you know? And that's mm. what, so I hated it also, Michael. <laughs> when it comes to giving <laughs> Arabic names or different personas, ooh, no. I used to hate it as well as a student. That's like me, student talking, I hate it. <laughs> the role plays. Yeah, because it feels fake. It's like you will never really reproduce those sentences in real life. Uh, because those sentences come from a book as well sometimes. Um, so, yeah, I don't know about that. But including, including the native component in classes, that's a brilliant idea. But um, where do you find native speakers to come and join a classroom, like in a regular um, program at school? That's kind of easy, difficult, I think. Oh, we can reorganize any program at any school. We are here to decide about the future of languages. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we can say we create a new context where it will be possible. So for yeah. example, in my online courses, what I do, I have a bunch of native speakers dealing with my students. So it's not just one teacher, it's maybe 10 people with different kinds of pronunciations. So even different German dialects and the course participants. You're frozen, Maria. Get used to dealing with different people are actual certified teachers because I think for some of them who have enough um, empathy uh, it's enough to be a native speaker and to be average social so to have an interest in people and that's enough and it works wonderfully. I remember I used to force my father to come into <laughs> some of my videos to say some kind of expression you know the expression of the day and I would force him to say it in a situational Arabic 
situation. And then I would explain the whole lesson like later, later on. So yeah. And now during my online courses, I'm always begging my sister, come, please come. Let's have a small conversation, you know, for them to, to hear a real Arab, not the recordings, not the book, you know, the books that you're using the MP3. It's better to hear it live from a, from a native. So I agree on that. <laughs> Yeah, and since we have the chance of, of uh, revamping the whole system, uh, you know, when, when I was taught Spanish and Latin and French back in the 90s, um, the internet was a thing you chatted on, that's it, and there were weird people on it. But now, if you have the network, uh, and I guess that's up to you as a teacher or the school, where you can actually connect two different classrooms, uh, if you have a, a German class studying Spanish and a Spanish class studying German, you know, you put them together like the way we are right now, and then you just break them out in rooms and have fun, uh, bonne chance, as they say in French. Uh, the, the, the possibilities of doing that now compared to before are just like amazing. Mm, right. But, but the problem with humans is that you don't like them all, right? And to find someone that you actually want to engage with, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges. And also that wants to engage with you on a similar level. So if I had a choice, I would create something like Her. You know the movie Her? Mm -hmm. The operating <laughs> system. The, the whole setup sequence is gorgeous. She only asked Timmy about your mother and he, he, there's silence. And then she says, okay, thank you. So to have a partner like that who could interact with you on that level, that is the future. So give us another 20 years and then AI is in, on that level, let's say. Maybe, maybe I'm too optimistic, but that would be my, my absolute dream because that's, they fell in love with each other. So falling in love is if you could kind of, how do you say that, motivate someone to fall in love, that would be the perfect system. But yeah, we are dreaming here, right? So we, we can invent whatever we want and then we just uh, oh, a pill order. For that. So we, we then order the IT team in and this, we say, okay, we have this idea, go make it happen. And let's go wild and invent happy pills that two people take together to, to come closer. And then once they are back to reality, they can actually engage nicer in German and actually uh, enjoy it more. So that, that would be a nice idea as well. This is a separate project, I think. We can ah. discuss it later. <laughs> right. but it's doable, right? It's just chemistry. So another question I have is like, what do we do with teachers' education? Because I, I heard that it used to be so uh, that people who never actually spoke a language really fluently, they were allowed to teach because they were certified teachers or teachers who were not motivated, who were not really passionate about what they did. So my first English teacher at school was uh, this type of, of person. And she spoke English like, today we will learn this topic and this is English. And then, well, comparing to that, the CDs we were listening to, they were honey to my ears when two teenagers from Dover were discussing something that they did at school and I didn't care about the teenagers, but at least it sounded a little bit like English. So if we have to decide uh, everything again, uh, what do we do with teachers' education? Who is allowed to teach and what does it take to become a teacher? I mean, that really comes back to what I was mentioning before about when I introduced myself, the, the whole notion of dialects, you know, should we should we try to aspire to that every country or most countries will have like this is the one dialect or should we actually enjoy the the flavor of dialects uh obviously it i would prefer a dialect that actually came from the country uh which i'm studying the language for um but at the same time there, there's a lot of i don't know um uh, there, there's something inspiring about how languages change and how languages change each other how we start using German words in Swedish and French words and and the the opposite. So, um, but I, I I would obviously appreciate having a teacher who knew the language and was certified in some way at least, so that I'm not just wasting my time learning something that people will think you speak weird. Yes, I'm from the south of Sweden. Well, that's about that's just the language, but. What is it that is necessary for a person to be able to teach? Is it just the methodology or is it something else? Because I think the, the passion thing or 
the general interest in people. So you have to be willing to to help your students get somewhere to improve, to to I don't know, evolve. And you may be a certified teacher of whatever, but if you don't care about the people, you're a crappy teacher, I think. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Passion and love for your the thing that you're teaching. You shouldn't you shouldn't be satisfied in teaching your dialect, like Martin said. You don't have to study the dialect. You know the dialect. You can teach it. You have to be certified at a certain level of the, the language or the material that you're teaching. But the passion is the most important thing. It tr is transparent to your students when you are teaching something out of love. You love the thing that you're teaching and you love the people that you're you're teaching it's it's incredible it's inspiring uh, in my situation my my students love the way i teach more than the thing i teach whatever thing that i tell them like if i teach them suddenly a sentence and it's uh, yeah you maria ah you <laughs> you, <laughs> you with me no i swear um so they start believing in you and as long as you're able to see the results of what you planted um then then this is for me the perfect teacher yeah um set some goals light this fire in them to, to always want more knowledge from you um that's uh, the key and of course a lot of patience patience yeah there are students um that teachers need a lot of patience to uh, work with to stay um always um, happy to stay with a positive uh, mood always smiling i always smile while while i teach especially when i teach something difficult like like, like the verbs or like <laughs> like the conditionals in arabic i always teach them with a smile so you know i i uh, i reduce the tension so yeah passion and love for the thing that you're you're teaching yeah i think there has to be a balance though because I mean, I'm passionate about pottery, but I suck at it. So passionate, passion is not enough. Sometimes you have to have the competence to do what you do as well, I think. And that's very difficult to judge if someone is passionate about doing something. But you can see straight away if that person is capable of teaching. Um, I think students can judge that straight away you can see that I think um, and that's a difficult question to answer <laughs> I have a very unpopular opinion I actually aim at making teachers redundant so um, the reason is what do you need a teacher for I totally agree if there's a person that you like that you enjoy that brings this topic closer to you all the best teachers I had in my past in school were people I could relate to emotionally. So, and that's also possibly my job in this online business. People can relate to me emotionally. Yeah. And, and I can relate to them, of course. So that, the, the emotional relationship to the language and is the important part. And let's say a teacher, whatever that is, uh, is, is a good focus for this. Yeah. But I, I don't think necessarily a teacher is someone who tells you how things are or sits there and waits patiently. I'm highly impatient, by the way, which is why I use online tools as much as I can because they are so patient. Um, I cannot compete with that. So um, I lost track, but you get the point. So I, I have nothing to teach. Everything that is there is there. I, what I do is I, I kind of level the field. I take everything from you that it concerns organization. I have experience. I know what material works. I know what technique works because I've done the research. So my job is prepare the field. You just enjoy. So imagine you're on a path full of pebbles. What I do is I pick the pebbles away or I give you a pair of shoes if I cannot. And that's all I do. You just walk and enjoy the environment and, and the whole walking. But I don't have to teach you anything. You learn. You are a learner. You are your own teacher and I show you how. And this is the ultimate aim of my view of what a teacher is. There's different views, of course. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. but I love that because I want to learn like that. I don't want anyone to tell me how things are. I want to discover it. Take the joy away from me by telling me how things are and what I have to do. Do your homework. Look at this. Look at the conjunctive. Beautiful. I can explain it, make it more digestible. And that's what we all do in a way. Anyhow. But I, I don't see myself as a teacher in the classical sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. We have to guide people through the 
content that it's available for them. But then again, it also depends in my experience on the students that I work with because some of them are very independent. So we discuss different topics, not grammar related at all. But there are some students who just need like need me to tell them how things are. And it really depends on the person in my experience. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You you can you can play along and and do that with them if they say please take my hand and guide me. If you want to do that, I'm I'm unfortunately not such a teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, of I show you how things are done and I I nudge you a little bit so that you go a little bit forward. And if it's not for you, it's fine. Yeah, but I I want you to be independent. I want you to be an adult and not to sit in my flat until you are eighty like Lorio. Yeah. You should look, Lori, watch Lorio. Actually, it's a wonderful, gorgeous German uh, comedy. Mm -hmm. you know? But yeah. the, uh, yeah, I have I totally both agree. types of students. Me too. It's divided both types, and you have to balance the thing when you have a group class, especially one on one. Is totally, totally. I agree with you, Michael. When when it's one on one, just one student, and you know what he wants, what he needs, what's the pace. But with a group uh, class, you have to pay attention to if they want you to feed them the material or or just give them homework and, and, and that's it. <laughs> My group classes are a thing uh, that's impossible. I've done that for 13 years. It's, it's impossible to learn language? No, you will always learn a language uh, because you're a learning machine. There is no way of not learning yeah? because you look at things, you make sense, sense of things. That's why you're still here. You are a survivor. But in a group class, you always have an average speed. You always find an average. So it's an average way to learn a language. Yeah. And it's a compromise. And it's fine if people want to make that compromise. I, I gave up after 15, 16 years of trying, even small groups, um, because I thought I want more. I'm, I'm a bit demanding. I want the best. I want the most. And in the beginning, I was all about efficiency. Um, so I agree. If you want to go use the tool of group, teaching you have to find a way to make it work absolutely and i did this for many many years but i it's not for me anymore i'm too old for that <laughs> yeah. i feel i'm too old for one-on-one -on -one lesson <laughs> that i have to repeat the same thing again especially for beginners you know beginners the material needs to be taught at the same level and you more or less you adjust the level of teaching something for the majority of people for the ones who want it fast or for the ones who are a little bit slow in uh, receiving no yeah, I've been there. I uh, also retired from that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we should be, yeah. you know, creating new things here and you're talking about retiring. So it's, it's not yeah. productive at all. <laughs> Martin, you are my last <laughs> hope. Come on. <laughs> Martin, no, well, I... 20 years. I'm uh, since 2008. How many years is that? <laughs> Help me with that. <laughs> No, but I mean, obviously, it depend, I mean, it, it depends on what age. I mean, we're, we're at one point we were talking about teaching kids, uh, other times teaching adults. Uh, obviously, there's a, there's a different approaches. But um, if I were to start learning a language, and then uh, I began by just, I thought I I learned something correctly, and that becomes the basis of all the mistakes I will make until someone corrects me twenty years later. Obviously, having some kind of guidance there, because. Sure, uh, learning independently, and you can learn in so many ways. I mean, you just you just, you don't learn a language just by being in the classroom. You learn by watching movies and TVs from uh, that country, or or any other kind of pop cultural influences that you can get. But at the end of the day, you still want someone. If you can't go to the country uh, and actually try the language out, which we can't right now, uh, then having someone to at least yeah, you you will be understood. You're you're not speaking Klingon on a different planet. But then again, everything might change in twenty years, and and the things we say now, they will look back and oh, they knew nothing of what was coming. So let's have another another conversation like this in twenty years, when we definitely all retired and and Siri <laughs> took over teaching languages. I'm afraid we have to round up, which is, it was surprisingly fast. I could 
listen to you for hours and I could talk to you for hours and I hope we will have after Corona at some point the the uh, possibility to do it live because I enjoyed it very much and thank you very much for being here and for sharing your ideas and forming the future of teaching and learning languages. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Was thank it, you. Was thank it you. a fun idea? <laughs> thank you to the audience. Have fun with the rest of the program at Expolingua. See you. Take care, yeah. Bye.